Welcome to Elevating La Cultura podcast, a space where I talk with Latinas who are passionate about what they do and are willing to share their passion with others to change the narrative, especially for the next generation. Each season is centered around different topics, but all with a Latina perspective. This is season five and is going to be a little different. It's going to be a mini season with only six episodes and they will all be solo cast where I dive a little deeper into sharing my own story. I'm so excited to share more about what has brought me to creating this space. So vamonos and let's get into it. Hola y bienvenidas to a new season. I'm Karina, host of Elevating La Cultura podcast, and I wrapped up season four in May, and after a two-month break, I'm excited to introduce season five. Over the break, y'all kept listening and catching up on past episodes, bringing us to over 2,300 downloads. So muchísimas gracias for continuing to listen and share with your community. If you haven't listened to the first four seasons, you can binge listen to season one featuring Latina entrepreneurs, season two highlighting Latinas in the health and wellness space, season three with Latina educators, and season four focused on artists and creators. Now each season elevates different stories, but all with the Latina perspective. We all have passion in our areas of expertise while also pouring into and empowering the next generation because honestly, it starts with us being willing to put in the work to make generational change. After doing a lot of healing work in my own life, I'm excited to introduce season five where I'll share my story with the listeners. I'm diving deeper on different areas of my life that have contributed to me doing what I do for my family and why I created this community where we elevate our cultura. So let's get into it with episode one. A huge part of who I am is being an entrepreneur. I remember when I was in middle school, there was an assignment where you were supposed to present what your parents did for their work. My father worked and my mother stayed home so I asked her what Bobby's job was. Now, I knew that he went to work every day really early in the morning, and he wouldn't come home until we were ready to go to bed. But beyond that, I didn't know what he actually did. My mother said he owns businesses, car repair shops. And I guess I knew that a little bit because sometimes I would go to work with him. But I didn't understand the complexity of what entrepreneurship was. So I went to school and said my father was the owner of a car repair shop, and that was it. As I was growing up, my father had hopes of me getting an MBA and working at a high-paying job and maybe even living downtown. Obviously, I didn't, but I did the work to get me there anyway. As I mentioned before, as a daughter of an immigrant, that push for a higher education is strong. I was conditioned to have that as my goal. So school became my job. Getting A's was the only option for me. The praise I got after a straight A report card was unmatched in my mind. It was my value. I saw that my father was working hard for his family and he wanted to ha his kids to have the education and opportunities he didn't have and I understood that. So I leaned into it. School was my priority, but I didn't know what the end goal was exactly. As long as I focused on what was right in front of me, I felt good. Where the confusion came in was in what I was supposed to do with my good grades. I guess, go to college, but then what? And it became a bigger question when I went to school for something that wasn't an MBA, but rather in a creative field. I'm gonna get into my college story later in another episode, but it's important to mention that during my college years, my end goal would shift every year, which is something that even I wasn't prepared for. When I graduated high school, I was like, great, I made it to the end and I got into college, pero ahora que? I guess I'll go to college and see what it's about and it would be all good as long as at the end, I would have a job that would pay the bills. The only thing is that I went to college from 2004 to 2008. 
meaning that I graduated into a recession. Now, I went to school about three hours from my childhood home. And so for the first few years, my father would drive me back and forth whenever I had a break or wanted to come home. These times ended up being the most special times in my life even now. This is when I truly understood who my father was, and even now, I know that I only know a fraction of his stories, but it would be three hours of random stories, stories about his past jobs, his childhood, current stories about what was happening and frustrating him at work. We would laugh, we would be serious, and we would simply enjoy each other's company. It was during this time that I understood what he did. He was an entrepreneur, and not just an entrepreneur, but someone who also poured into other people and taught them and encouraged them to be entrepreneurs. He gets excited about ideas and figuring out how to make them work and turn them into a profitable business. He still does. I realized that he valued education in his kids' lives, but also in his own life. Even in his 60s, he is still taking classes and learning new skills. When I graduated college, I had no desire to go into the field that I graduated in. And with graduating into a recession, it was no surprise that I went to work for my father. I had worked with my father during summers in high school, And I came home for the first two summers I was in college and literally helped him launch a new business. It was a Mexican restaurant. So when I graduated college, I asked my father if I could work for him, to which he said, yes. And I worked so hard, probably the hardest I worked in my life. I remember waking up before 6 a.m. and working past 6 p.m. most days. I'd work in the restaurant, I'd work at the other shops he had, I did all the things to help my father's job run smoother. Accounting, inventory, random deliveries, serving at the restaurant, being the cashier, ingredient prep, I was a dishwasher, whatever was needed, I did it. But I was tired. However, I was also fulfilled to be able to help my father in this way. And it was there that I learned and saw the potential I had to one day build my own business. Ironically, after burning myself out, he fired me. Yes, he fired me from his business. I was shocked, shook, but es lo que era. And so I decided to move back to Michigan where my boyfriend at the time lived And I went to school to get certified as a CNA and started working in a nursing home in Michigan. At the time, my boyfriend had a side business taking pictures in his hometown for weddings, families, really anything people needed pictures of. When we were engaged, I started going with him to these sessions and started helping him out. And that is where I saw the potential of building a photography business. He knew the craft. I had the basics of photography, but I knew I could learn quickly. And most importantly, I knew the framework on how to build a business. And I never thought in my mind that I couldn't do it. It was just a matter of when. Here is where we start seeing how photography made its way into my life. I was ambitious and I wanted to move his side business to Chicago and grow it so that it could support us and we could work for ourselves. Super ambitious filled with all kinds of hope. It was cute. After moving to Chicago in 2010, after we got married, I started working full-time again with my father. Yes, after some conversations, he took me back as his assistant doing similar things to what I had been doing before, but with clear set hours. And he even employed my husband. So this white man was working on the south side of Chicago in a car repair shop. Honestly, it's where he learned more Spanish than he had in his Spanish classes in school. It was a time for us to gain some financial stability while we tried to build our wedding photography business. 
And for that, I am so grateful to my father for allowing us that opportunity. I worked and worked at learning journalistic photography and pairing that with weddings. I have to remind you that this was in 2010, before Pinterest, before Instagram, before it was trendy to be in the wedding and events industry. I was entering the space as it was starting to explode and I just soaked it up. By the next year, we had finished most of our Michigan weddings and had started to book at least half of our weddings for the year in Chicago. It was then that I stopped working for my father, which gave me the opportunity to really focus on building our business and laying the foundation for how I really wanted to serve our couples. We were starting to build our portfolio in Chicago and I was slowly growing our profits. By 2013, I was attending all the networking events. And I mean all of them. If there was an event, I was there. I was coordinating pretend events called styled shoots, where we would collaborate with many vendors to produce a pretend event in hopes of getting our work published. After a few of these, I realized that I was doing a lot of work but not necessarily seeing the recognition that I saw my other peers getting. It was in 2014 that I had felt that I knew a lot of the people in the wedding industry. I was well connected. I was growing our brand in the space. I felt like I was thriving. I was excited to be building something that could serve both my husband and I, and we can do it together. I was excited, but at the same time, I started to notice that I wasn't booking weddings at the same price point and at the same rate as my peers. I was hosting coffee dates where people would quote unquote pick my brain and I would be so excited to share all the things only to see their success skyrocket in a quarter of the time it had taken me to get where I was in my business. I was truly happy for them and just attributed it to me not working hard enough, not having enough time. The fact that I also had two kids during this time, I thought was setting me back. I pulled from my academic conditioning that if I didn't get an A, it was because I didn't study hard enough. If I did something wrong at work, it was because I wasn't paying attention enough to know what to do. I had this expectation to get it right the first time, to always excel, And if I wasn't, then that meant that I wasn't doing enough to achieve what I needed to. And when I saw that I was getting no's after a booking session with potential clients, that meant that I wasn't doing enough to prove my worth. I started to feel bad for what I was charging until I saw that someone who I had helped had just launched her business at a higher price point than I was charging five years in. It was around that time that thankfully I met a friend, a Latina, who started to share the same struggles in her photography business. I was surprised that I wasn't alone. I was also a little relieved that I wasn't alone and that my thoughts weren't just me letting my mind get tripped up. This is when we realized maybe this industry wasn't built to value us as people of color. By 2016, I had finally been able to book out a full year of weddings. I had built our business to have a healthy year of profits. But it was also the year that I decided that something needed to change. It was the year that I had this particular wedding that is the cornerstone of my decision to leave the wedding industry. This wedding was on Cinco de Mayo and it appropriated Mexican culture right in front of me. This wedding made me truly realize that I would always have to be working twice as hard as my peers to charge my worth while also having to navigate blatant racism. 2016 was a pivotal year. The year where I realized I had achieved this goal of building a profitable business, but the year I decided I had to shift and let go of what I had built. Now, it didn't happen overnight. I had to come to terms with the fact that my ideas about jobs and opportunity were built on lies and biases that didn't support me. We finished all the weddings that we had under contract in 2016 and 2017. And in 2018, I shifted and launched something new that was under my own name 
and elevated my culture. I also stopped marketing our photography brand and only taking weddings if they were referrals from planners that we enjoyed working with or from past clients. I started working with another company, helping to grow their business so I could keep the cash flow going while I shifted. 2020 was supposed to be my last year with that company and the year that I completely shifted to educating people about Mexican culture through my photography and selling more framed prints. Pero ya sabes what happened in 2020. So all those plans shifted again and here we are in 2022, finishing out postponed weddings and I can happily say that I am more aligned with what I am doing now. This is the last year that I'm doing any kind of wedding work as I finish up my contracts that were pushed back two years while also assisting the company I work for. In the past two years, I launched this podcast, Elevating La Cultura, and we're going into our fifth season. And soon I'll be opening a studio space to invite other Latina creatives to collaborate and to have a space to grow their business. I've also grown my photography offerings released three collections, new products at carinamora.com. I've also grown my speaking business and have started offering guided trips to Mexico. But most importantly, I shifted my circle, my community. I stopped listening to predominantly white mentors because there was always a disconnect to what they were trying to tell me to do and the results I was supposed to be seeing. I was conditioned to believe that there was something wrong with me, when in reality, it was a disconnect with the opportunities and the networks and connections they already had that I didn't have or have access to. I'm immensely grateful for that one friend who had the foresight to call out the skewed opportunities in the wedding and events industry for those who didn't already have the network or access to money for top equipment because... Let me tell you, I was asked on many client meetings what gear I had, as if the brand of equipment was more important than the skill. Ignorant questions that really place an unnecessary divide based on class. So shout out to Jasmine from the Firehouse Dream, who was that light for me to help me realize that I wasn't alone in being offended by some of the experiences we had in the wedding and events industry. We're still really great friends, and we're both working toward shifting the entrepreneurial narrative for the next generation. You can listen to her story on episode four of the podcast. I share this part of my story because it's the foundation of who I am as an entrepreneur today. And being an entrepreneur is a huge part of my life. I joke that I don't think I'll ever be able to stop working or building a business or at least helping others build theirs. I know this because I see my father doing the exact same thing. He has since sold all of his businesses and is, and still he is reaching for the next thing he can learn or do. I have gone through a lot of healing about how much pressure I put on myself from such an early age to excel in school to realizing that as I built my business, it was on the lie that my value should be placed on how fast I grew our business and how much money I made when in reality the playing field wasn't fair in the first place. Instead, I've learned to focus on the impact I'm having for my family and my peers around me. It's so important for me to have these conversations because I need people to know they aren't alone. We've been conditioned to assimilate, to code switch, to simply be thankful for each opportunity we have and not really advocate for ourselves. But it's not you. It's the system that hasn't been built for us. I'm determined in helping change that though. And it all starts with conversations like this so we can realize we're not alone. The next episode, I'm going a little deeper into how my identity as a Mexican American has shifted throughout my life. I'm always up for continuing the conversation, so subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode when it goes live. I also encourage you to share with others because the more people we have talking about our stories as Latinas living in the U.S., the easier it will be to make a collective change for a better future. There will be a new episode every Tuesday, so after you listen, feel free to take a screenshot, to post on Instagram, and tag at Elevating La Cultura, or send me a DM. You can also comment on our YouTube video if you're watching online. I always like to hear from people and how they resonate with the stories that I share. So, Leave a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get more ears listening to these stories and we can continue elevating La Cultura. I'm also excited to announce our first 
in-person, one-day event called Cultura Presente, Celebra Tus Raices, where we are diving deep on how to deconstruct our relationship with assimilation and recognize our cultural power. Shout out to my partner Sandy from Beauty Queens and collaborators Izzy and Daisy from the Hablando Claro podcast and our host location, Neuro Yoga Institute. You can get more info at elevatinglacultura.com slash events. All right. Enjoy the rest of your day, afternoon, evening, whenever you're listening. Y nos vemos next week. Bye.